as an influencer, we know it's incredibly important to have a website as our home base online because social media can disappear at any time and we can lose our followers or have our reach limited. But having that home base of a website is going to allow people to find us and to learn more about us. But should we have a blog in addition to that website? This is actually going to be a fantastic idea and professional influencer Austin Tazone is going to break down everything you need to know about creating a blog, monetizing a blog, how often you should be posting, what type of content you should be posting, and how to deal with SEO to make sure you're getting views inside of your blog. Let's jump in. I'm Austin Tassone. I'm a New York City-based fashion and beauty content creator, and I also create educational resources for influencers. Today, we are talking all about blogs for influencers. Are they helpful? What should we be doing and what do we need to know? So Austin, I am a big fan of websites and blogs, and I know you have an opinion on this too. Should influencers be having blogs? Yes, I have had a blog since 2012, and I feel like for a while there was kind of this divide between traditional bloggers and influencers. And I will say this, influencers at the very least, I believe, should have a website, some kind of landing page where you share your contact information, a little bit about you, examples of your previous work, and hopefully maybe a couple of posts or two. If you are maybe a fashion influencer who primarily creates content on Instagram, maybe that's just a roundup of your current favorite pieces from a website like Nordstrom or Revolve or wherever you like to shop. Or maybe if you are a beauty TikToker, it is links to all of your everyday makeup products, something to just be grounding and something that you have control over. Because the big difference between a blog or website and a platform like Instagram or TikTok is the difference between an algorithm controlling who sees your content and search controlling who sees your content. So in that sense, I would highly encourage every influencer to at the very least have a website, but Blogs are amazing as well, and there's so many reasons for that that I'm sure we're going to get into. And I've always said it's incredibly important to make sure we have those websites because the social media platforms can disappear at any time, but we have control of our content on a website or on a blog. And blogs are really nice because it's continually updated content. If you are putting out blog articles or you're uploading different posts, this gets ranked really, really well inside of search. And because you're creating new content, you're then going to drive more traffic toward yourself. So let's break down everything we need to know about blogs for influencers, starting with how often do you think we should be posting on our blogs? Well, I think the beauty of a blog is it's one of those platforms where unlike, you know, TikTok, where you constantly have to be feeding the algorithm and the quality can kind of suffer a little bit. I find that on blogs, high quality content can get away with being published at a lower frequency. I personally currently just blog once a week. I have pretty much been blogging once a week, maybe with a one or two year exception where I was blogging twice a week a few years ago. And I have still seen really great growth from my blog. I've been able to land sponsorships with brands I really care about. I make money from affiliate content and I was able to qualify for an ad network where I can earn passive revenue from blog posts that have been published even a few years ago, which is amazing. And one of the things that we talk about a lot is how to make sure we're getting eyes on our blogs or on our content, on our YouTube channel. And I know that titles are very, very important. So talk to me a little bit about what you do to make sure you have a title that's going to get those clicks. You know what it originally reminded me of when you said that is when I was a magazine editor, we used to have kind of like a really punchy headline with a sub headline that would explain a story or a fashion editorial further. That really punchy headline might be something like plaid for fall, right? But then that headline underneath it will say the best ways to style fall's hottest fabric plaid. And so I actually tell people to like reverse it basically for a blog and to add the headline with more context as your title for your blog post, because you want to think about what someone is typing into Google and what someone is searching for. And another reason blogs are amazing is because that title, you know, can really match up with a search term that someone is directly plugging into Google. And the intent behind someone typing in something to Google and finding a matching result, they're much more likely to not only click on it, but take action, make a purchase, continue reading, look for more of your blog posts than they are if they're aimlessly scrolling on an algorithm controlled platform. So that's why titles are amazing. They're really eye catching. 
you can include keywords in them. And if you can align that with what people are searching for on Google, so Google can match that user with what they're searching for, then you're golden. Now, when it comes to creating your titles, do you do any research on this or are you specifically working on keywords that you think are going to be searched? Oh, definitely doing research. And I'm actually now at the point where I don't even start writing a blog post until I've validated my topic. And I think why some people get a little turned off from SEO is because they think, okay, I can't write a post unless I find a keyword about it. But the thing is, you can find a keyword for pretty much any topic. The thing is really just finding the right keyword. And so if I wanted to write a blog post about summer dresses, if I just went and searched that keyword, I would discover that that has a really, really high monthly search volume and that it's probably a very competitive keyword. I can tell you this without even typing into Google, where there are probably websites like Cosmopolitan or Vogue or Who, What, Where that are ranking in the top for that search term because it's so broad and because they have more authority with Google. They have a larger readership. They've been around for a while and they are seen as an expert in that field. So I would just need to narrow that search, you know, using keyword research and find a lower monthly search volume that people were still actively looking for, but also with lower competition so that my blog has a chance to actually rank for that search term. Now we've talked a lot about SEO. Let's break this down for people who are new to the concept of search engine optimizations. What do we need to know with this? It really is what it sounds like. It is optimizing your content to be found in search engines. Because if you think about what Google's job is, Google's job is to deliver you the best and most relevant results in the shortest amount of time. And when you think about Google scanning every web page on the internet and your search result popping up fairly quickly, it's actually a very impressive thing that they're able to do and they do it better than anybody else. So you want to get in the mind of someone searching on Google Think about what you search on Google. You can even go back and look at your last few searches and think about whether or not you actually go past the first couple of search results. Chances are you don't because Google's algorithm is so good at not just understanding what you're typing in, but even making inferences about it. So for example, if you were searching, you know, let's say your toilet was leaking and you were searching for New York City plumber, you might also get a YouTube video about like how to stop a toilet leaking because Google can infer you're looking for a plumber because you might have a leak or something like that. So that's where the algorithm is really smart. And that's where SEO is actually more creative than people think, because you want to think not just about the exact key phrase that they're typing in, but why they might be searching for it. And it's really important to make sure you are doing your research as you are creating SEO friendly titles and conversations within the blog post that you're building. We've got lots of videos on how you can do this, which we're going to link below. But if you want to take it a step further, if you want to learn a little bit more about it, Austin, I know that you've got a little something that you're working on. What do we need to know? Yeah. So I also have an SEO workshop. It is very aptly titled what you really need to know about SEO. I created this workshop for anyone who has really, you know, thought about starting a blog, but felt really disorganized or wanted to grow on YouTube, but wasn't sure why their content wasn't getting a lot of views based on my own successes with SEO in the past few years, which has included, you know, doubling my YouTube followers in a year, qualifying for an ad network on my blog and joining the Pinterest Creator Rewards Fund because of my searchable content on that platform as well. And so the workshop covers all three of those platforms, starting with how to do keyword research, a really in-depth tutorial with examples so that you can understand user intent, what we were just talking about, and then talking about how to apply it to each of those searchable platforms, depending on what your strengths are. If you don't feel like you're a writer, but you love to talk, maybe starting a YouTube channel is a great way to get your content on a searchable platform. And searchable platforms have truly changed my life and my business. I mean, my passive revenue is up. The amount of people I'm able to reach is up. And I'm also able to step away when I feel like I need a break, which as a creative person happens more than you might think. So all of that and more is inside the SEO workshop. It's 60 minutes in and out, and you can refer back to it as often as you'd like. And we're going to link that down below as we continue our conversation. Make sure you are checking that out. If you are looking to grow your blog or your YouTube channel or your online presence, especially when it comes to studying and really leveraging that 
power of SEO. So as we are creating our blogs, as we're creating our titles that are going to be search friendly and going to make sure that we are leveling up how we're ranking in Google, in YouTube, in all the other search platforms, how long should we be creating our blog posts? Do short blog posts translate really well? Should we be looking at longer form content? What have you found works really well? So it depends a little bit, but I'd love to add some context to that answer because I know it's not a very satisfying one. I think that first understanding what type of content you're creating is important. So if you're creating more trending content and more reaction kind of like quick blog posts, maybe it's something like Rihanna just dropped a new lip product and you cover beauty. That could be a quick 500 word write up that if you're one of the first to it could start ranking in Google fairly quickly. You might also think about more seasonal content. So maybe a few weeks ahead of Black Friday, you're publishing the most popular sales from last year, and then you kind of continue to update that page as you head into Black Friday this season. That's another thing to think about where it might be kind of a medium length piece of content. But in general, if we're talking about really growing a blog, developing trust with your audience and successfully publishing uh, you know, more high quality content at a lower frequency, I would recommend creating evergreen content pieces. Again, the example of beauty is Rihanna dropping a new lip oil today versus best makeup techniques for beginners. That is something that will continually be searched for over time versus something that might have a quick spike when it's first published and then kind of trail off after that. So you can have a mix of these different content types on your site. I have transitioned my blog personally over the years towards this more long form evergreen content. And one way to also figure out the length is to figure out what keyword you are going after. Look and see how long the content is for the first five pieces that are ranking. Because if those websites are publishing this insanely long form detailed content, in order to outrank them, you're probably want, going to want to you know, at least mirror that level of length. A few times I have gone after very low volume, low competition keywords. I've noticed that the posts that are ranking are maybe even 100 words or 200 words. So even if I publish a 500 word blog post, that is giving Google more information to deduce what my blog post is about, to see what context I can provide and what additional information that maybe the original person who was ranking didn't have. And I could be outranking because of that. In general, I would say that most blog posts of mine now are between 1,000 and 1,500 words. And you mentioned updating blog posts could potentially be a good idea if you have evergreen content from potentially last year on Black Friday, and this year you are going to update that a little bit. Let's talk about how and when you can and should be updating older content. I think it's great to always kind of be auditing your own website and just have a sense of how long it's been since you've last updated pieces, thinking about if you've had your blog for a long time like me, maybe there are some pieces back from nine or 10 years ago that aren't really relevant or serving anyone or, you know, helpful to you. So going back in and just doing a check over to update things, I think One of the biggest categories of content creators who are often updating things are travel bloggers, because especially in the last two years, there may be some businesses that you've spotlighted in a city guide before that are no longer there. There may be plenty new that have opened. So I think just, you know, even setting a reminder in your calendar to every six months, take a look at some of your recent blog posts and see what might need to be updated. That's a great way to go about it. That's the other thing to keep in mind about creating seasonal content as well. If you're doing like a Black Friday sales roundup, that post is only going to be relevant, you know, kind of during that time period. But you might have a different goal for that blog post. Maybe that blog post goal is more about affiliate revenue than it is about continuously bringing repeat traffic to your website. So that's one big thing to think about. And if you do update a blog post, I believe WordPress gives you the option, I'm a Squarespace user, but I believe WordPress gives you the option to add a second published date, an updated date, or you could even type at the bottom of your blog post, you know, last updated on this day so that Google can see that date if it's re-indexing and recrawling your site and understand that updates were made. So when it comes to creating these content pieces, 
what do you think we need to know in terms of marketing it? Because we can't just drop it on our blog or our website and hope and pray that maybe it gets some views, maybe it gets some hits in search. So how do you go about marketing these pieces once they're published? You know, ever since I really started learning SEO, I have found that almost all of my website traffic is coming from organic search. So luckily, a lot of the pressure of marketing it that I used to feel with my blog has been taken off of me. That being said, I do always like to at least notify my audience when I do have a new blog post. So usually that will be in my Wednesday email newsletter. I will always post an Instagram story when there's a new blog post. I will create some graphics on Canva that I can schedule out to Pinterest with that blog post link because having it in these different places is just one other way that someone might find it. But where I look at my blog traffic from 2018, where only 35% of it was coming from organic search versus at the end of 2021, where 79% of my blog traffic was coming from organic search, I can safely say that creating good content in the first place, doing the SEO research and getting ranked on Google is definitely the way I've been able to grow my audience the most. I love it. Now, I want to talk a little bit about ads revenue when it comes to posting on a blog, because you do have to qualify and then you are able to insert ads into your content. So what do we need to know in that realm? I think the big thing to know is that this is usually done through an ad network. It's not like you go to Sephora and ask if they want to advertise on your blog. You will do it through an ad network that basically acts as the middleman between what they call publishers, that's bloggers, and advertisers. So some of the popular ones like Azoic, SheMedia, Mediavine, and AdThrive are ones where once you really have a substantial amount of traffic, you will start seeing revenue from. I would say that a lot of people try to monetize their sites too early. Azoic requires 10,000 monthly sessions to qualify for it. And I do think that it's good to wait until you've built up that audience and built up that traffic to apply to an ad network, just because before then you're going to see pennies probably. And you also don't want to turn off any of your loyal readers who have been there from the beginning by throwing ads in their face right from the beginning. And I think also finding the right ad network for you is really important. I am part of She Media, and I have been since October of last year. And what I really like about them is, first of all, that their advertisers are very in tune with my audience. I've seen Sephora ads on my site, Squarespace ads, you know, ads from companies that I actually use and like. And I'm also able to control where I place my ads as well and what type of ads. So maybe I'll just have one video ad because I get a higher RPM or revenue per thousand views on the video ad than I do on a static ad, but then maybe that's the only ad that's there. So really balancing it out and figuring out how to incorporate them in a way that won't you know, kind of turn off your audience, but that will also make you lots of money because some bloggers, especially once you get to the media vine or ad thrive level are making quite decent income just from their blog ads. And I love that we have the opportunity not only to build our brands through social media and through our presence online, but we can build that revenue into what we're doing through creating very effective blogging content. Anything else that we need to know before we wrap up today? I think just again to reiterate that you can create one great high quality piece of content on your blog. Maybe it took you six hours to create, but that return on investment, especially once you are able to join an ad network, it can last you a lifetime. And I think that that is something that Instagram and TikTok simply can't do yet. And I know they're working on improving the search functionality, but in order to really create this great content and get it seen, this is the best way that I've found so far. And this is coming from someone who has tried and failed at plenty of different Instagram growth strategies and techniques before. So if you're fed up with algorithms, I highly recommend getting started on at least one searchable platform. I think blogs are great. YouTube and Pinterest are options as well. And to make sure that we are leveling up our blog posts, we want to make sure we're sending everybody over to your workshop. So one more time, we're going to link that down below, name of that and what we're going to learn. Sure. So you can learn more by taking my workshop. It's called What You Really Need to Know About SEO. That's available over on my website, austintosone.com. And you can find me everywhere on social media at austintosone. Perfect.
perfect. I am so sorry. I don't know what's happening. There's like a little bug in my office right now oh, and no. it keeps coming at my face. Oh no. <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm talking, it's like attacking me. So <laughs> I'm you're sorry. Good. I got a weird there for a second. No, you're good. Did it go Ooh. away? Um, it, it has been uh, coming at me this entire time, but it got very aggressive the last couple of minutes. Oh my God, how rude. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it, it's attracted to all my ring lights. So because it's like reflecting off of my, what is apparently very white skin right now, it's just like coming at me. Oh it's my been gosh. very fun. Yes. All right. So we are going to do our episode on setting goals and accomplishing those as an influencer. So I know you've got some really great content on that on your TikTok that I was seeing. Talk to me a little bit about what I need to know in terms of you creating goals and getting those accomplished. Yeah, I think for me, the first biggest thing is to like break goals down just when they're too big and they feel really overwhelming. It's just so hard to feel like you're ever going to meet them. So I first set yearly goals, then break them down quarterly, then break them down monthly. Um, Perfect. I do have some goal setting worksheets inside my Patreon. And then I also recently did a YouTube video about like doing a mid-year check-in with goals. Um, oh, good. So good. I could send you like links yes, to both please. of those. Yeah. What else with goals? Oh, and for me also like being full-time or whatever amount of time you have to do your goals, I always say like the goals can't be more than 75% of your time. Like it's great to have them, but you need to set aside that time for emails, DMs, just did like things you don't foresee. Oh, my laptop broke. Now I have to, you know, you need to leave that time for sure. I love that. And I feel like that particular component is something that most people don't talk about. They talk about breaking down their goals and like putting them in steps, but we don't talk about leaving in that extra time for the issues that come up. So I very much yeah. like that we can focus on that. Okay, great. I That's something I learned when I was working at the tech startup that I was at in 2019, because we were setting all of these goals. And I was like, I don't have time. And like my manager and I, it took us a while to realize, like, I don't have time because like, I'm also responsible for like our Instagram account and this and that. So it was honestly a relief to realize that and to be like, oh, I can't set these crazy over ambitious goals. I need to, to mix them in too, you know, like some goals that it's like, if I put in this action, this will be the result versus, oh, I think I can grow to this number on TikTok, but I don't know. That kind of thing. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. Beautiful. Okay. So in that case, same deal as before, we're going to go ahead, give that little pause, stare at each other, smile, and look pretty. You can count to 10 in your head and jump into your intro and we will jump into our, this conversation. And hopefully I will not be attacked by insects that I see flying around this room. Oh God. Summer in Virginia, man. It's a fun time here. It's fun buggy time. <laughs> I'm Austin. I'm a New York City based fashion and beauty content creator. And I also create educational resources for influencers. I've been watching you on social media for a long time and you have created some really cool things inside of your brand and business. And I know one of the topics you like discussing and I love hearing about from you is how you are setting your goals and then accomplishing them within your influencer platform. So let's talk a little bit about first how to set those goals and then how to break them down so that we can accomplish them appropriately. Yeah, I think that one of the reasons I started setting goals even before I was a full-time content creator is because I've always viewed this as a business and something that I've been really interested in growing and expanding and hopefully making um, my income source, which now I have. And I couldn't do that if I wasn't kind of setting goals and benchmarks for myself and setting also the appropriate check-ins. So for me, what I like to do at the top of the year is really dream big, think about what I want to accomplish this year, and then set some year-long goals. And year-long goals are a little tricky to envision and really like break down unless you set those checkpoints in between and give yourself time to see how things are going, potentially make adjustments and continue to work towards them. So after I set my yearly goals at the top of the year, and if you're not watching this in January or whatever it is, I would highly encourage you to do this at any point during the year. You do not have to wait for the first of the month or next Monday to do these things, but this is just kind of how I approach it now when I do remember to kind of start things at the beginning. But then from yearly goals, I break it down to quarterly goals. And quarterly goals have honestly been 
pretty game changing for me. I first started doing quarterly goals actually at my previous full time job where I was working at a tech startup. And that felt like a great amount of time to dive into specific projects, really get things done and have more than just 30 days to get things up and moving. So for example, one of my quarterly goals from this previous quarter was to launch my workshop, which is now, you know, sold evergreen on my website, but it's not just as easy as launching a workshop, right? There's so much that goes into it from brainstorming the concept, creating the slides, trying to do a test run with someone, marketing it, and then actually all of the technical components that go into setting it up. So that is something that I knew I couldn't get done in a month, but was a quarterly goal. And then I break those quarterly goals down into monthly goals. So maybe again, for that example of creating a workshop, maybe the first month is to get all of the slides done and get all of the information ready to go. Then the next month is focused on how do I get this set up on my website? How do I collect payments? All of those types of things. And then the last month is marketing the workshop and then actually making it go live. So that is kind of how I like to set my goals. I think that, you know, it gives you enough time to still have a big picture, but it helps break it down to set milestones along the way where you can check in and say, I'm a little behind here. Why am I behind? Is it because I haven't been wanting to focus on it? Is it because something else came up? And just assessing your progress because setting that yearly goal is great, but if you don't have any systems in place to make sure that you actually achieve it, then you might find yourself feeling disappointed. Now, I'm one of those people that when I'm setting those goals and I'm figuring out what I'm going to be doing inside of my business, I like to start at the end point and work my way back. I love reverse engineering things so that I've got that big overall goal and then I can break it down into smaller, more achievable steps. Is that what you do or do you kind of start from the opposite side and work your way up? I think it depends on the goal. I think that one thing I did at the top of the year was I set a revenue goal for myself because since this is my first calendar year as a full-time content creator, I wanted to kind of just have an understanding of what I wanted to achieve in terms of my overall salary. So one thing to know about that is, of course, my income will vary from month to month. And it's also part of understanding the business of a content creator, where in the past I've made usually around 50% of my total revenue from brand deals. But a lot of those brand deals tend to happen in the fourth quarter of the year. So when I checked in at the halfway point of 2022 and saw that I was behind on my revenue target for brand deals, I didn't freak out because I know that having done this for years, that the majority of the income from brand deals will appear in the fourth quarter. And that's just something I understand and know about the seasonality of this business now. So in that sense, of course, you can't guarantee that you're going to get to that number that you set, but it helps you along the way say, am I behind on my affiliate revenue? Am I where I want to be in terms of consulting? Did I learn halfway through this year that I hate consulting and now I need to put that revenue stream aside and focus on workshops and group coaching and things like that? So In that sense, setting that number and then identifying how you're going to work backwards is great. And one of the ways that like bloggers, content creators, and influencers can also earn consistent income is through passive revenue streams like YouTube ad revenue, blog revenue, um, affiliates. So if you have any income stream that you see as consistent, you can use that to predict where you're going to land at the end of the year and then work backwards to kind of figure out how else am I actually going to get there. And I think it's really important to point out that as you are creating these goals and you're kind of scheduling this into your calendar, things may not go exactly as planned and you may have to pivot a little bit. You might have to adjust a little bit, but you can't always do that if you're so incredibly structured that there is no wiggle room inside of what you're doing. So what do we need to know about making sure we're planning in time for unforeseen things? Yeah, I think one big thing that I've learned over the years is I've set these goals and originally I would wake up and spend every day trying to get closer to these goals. And that sounds like it's a good idea, but what you don't necessarily remember is just what you need for the day-to-day operations of your business. So that could be making sure that you're posting every day on TikTok, that could be replying to Instagram DMs, that could be just going through your email inbox and seeing, oh, is there an event next week? I want to go to that. That's good for networking. Like, you know, it might not 
every action that you do might not necessarily tie into your goal and that's okay. I have learned for myself that what works for me is trying to dedicate like 75% of the time that I have to dedicate towards content creation. And so for me, that's full time for you. You have five hours a week to dedicate to content creation, leave one of them so that you can deal with all of the day-to-day -day things that you need to deal with and that you have time for potentially unforeseen circumstances. Like if you drop your phone and it stops working, you need to go get a new phone or a great opportunity pops up that requires you to travel at the last minute and you need to move things around. I think that being able to plan in a little bit of that flexibility is key and flexibility is still a lesson that I'm learning, not just in my professional life, but in my personal life as well. Just trying to be able to go off plan, to go with the flow um, and not completely fall apart when a plan doesn't fully come to fruition. <laughs> I agree because we oftentimes come up against things that we did not realize were going to happen and it will completely derail what we're doing and being able to then cope and work with that to continue to move forward is incredibly important. So do you have tips on what to do or how to process it when things kind of blow up around us and we can't take the steps forward that we had anticipated? <laughs> I almost just said therapy, which by the way, I highly recommend. <laughs> um, but also just setting up your business so that it's hard as a content creator, I'm the first to admit it, but setting up your business so that you can step away and things won't completely fall apart with you gone. I know for me, I don't have any employees or anything, it's just me, but I am able to still take weekends off to take PTO when I want to, because I have things in place like you know, YouTube videos that are generating that ad revenue, like I said, I have YouTube videos that point towards my digital products so that I can make sales on those products without having to hop on my Instagram stories every single day and be like, hey guys, this is me for the 800th time talking about my invoice template. Like no one wants to hear that on my Instagram stories. They want to see on my Instagram stories that I am getting a morning coffee in my neighborhood or that I'm having a pool day with a friend or something. And I feel like having to show up and sell on platforms or show up and you know, be the one thing that is driving your business forward is just a lot of pressure. So whatever it is for you, whether it's finding an income stream, maybe like affiliates that works well for you, or you know, doing kind of one big workshop each quarter that brings in a ton of revenue for you that then you can kind of pay yourself out from later on, just getting strategic about how to keep money coming in without you necessarily having to be parked in front of your computer every day has definitely been a big lesson that I've learned. And it's even changed the way that I set goals. And one of my big goals for the third quarter of 2022 has been to expand my passive revenue streams, which I've done by launching a live workshop, by um, adding updates to an existing ebook, and by hopefully launching a new digital product at the end of this month. So that is even a new goal that I've set for myself that is all about working towards a larger goal of just giving me more freedom to focus on the creative part of my business and also to be able to, like I said, take time off when I want to. And we've got lots of tutorials on how to create passive income, how to do systems and automations inside of your business to make sure that you have the availability to step away when you need to and still survive and make that income inside of your business. Because we know when it comes down to building our business and building a luxurious life that we love, we really have to make sure we're focused on those bigger and smaller goals inside of our businesses and actively taking steps to make sure that that is protected. So when it comes to creating those big and small goals, Austin, what advice do you have in terms of balancing out the big things that we're going to be doing year long projects and the smaller day to day things? I really feel like the best thing you can also do is regardless of what goals you set one month, they don't have to be perfect goals. You can set anything is to then at the end of the month, look back and say to yourself, what did I like about this month? What worked about this month for me? And where do I wish I had been able to spend more time? Or what did I not like about how I had a nonstop inbox where I couldn't even think because for some reason, so many requests were coming in. Maybe then that is a sign to next month you need to hire a VA to clean up your inbox. They don't even have to be a long-term employee of yours. You could hire them for a one-month contract and say, I need my inbox organized, let's go. Or what you were talking about before with like automating your systems and getting all of those things in place, 
maybe instead of feeling like you're filming one YouTube video a week and you're having a hard time keeping up with it, you can batch create content and on YouTube, you can schedule things out. So you can even create three videos, schedule them all out on the day that you say you're going to upload so that you can then take a few weeks off from that platform, focus on other things or take a break. And so I think that setting goals that you know you can achieve by doing certain actions, like you know showing up consistently on TikTok, let's say, thinking about what goals require those input actions versus the output actions, like, oh, I want to get to 50,000 followers on TikTok. You can want to say that, but that might require you going viral. That might require a whole host of components kind of falling into place for that reason. But if you just want to be consistent, you want to show up for your audience and you want to build content, that's a goal you know you can achieve. So I think that setting those eventual milestones, I also like to do that kind of as a year long goal. Like I have a goal for 2022 to grow my audience overall to a certain number. And the way that I'm going to achieve that is by posting content, by trying new things and by posting across a bunch of different platforms this year. So that is something that I know I can control and I know I can do. And I try to estimate the number based on my previous growth, what I think I can do this year and which platforms I'm prioritizing. And as we're jumping into creating new goals for our business, it's really important to make sure we are tracking it and we are checking in and we are using tools and resources at our disposal to make sure we're elevating what we're doing and making it easy on ourselves. So what resources should we be considering when creating these goals? Oh man, well, I love things like a project organizer. So I've been using Notion and really loving it for several weeks now. Notion is just a place where I can organize weekly to-do lists, yearly goals. I have a project manager on there where I was able to create a spreadsheet when I launched my workshop, for example, to show here urgent tasks. Here's if they are in progress, not started or completed. And here's the date that I'm hoping to get them done by. I feel like having this backend has really helped my business. And there was a day a few months ago where I was feeling a little scatterbrained. And I said, today's goal is to get myself organized on Notion and setting, you know, putting my goals on hold for that one day to get organized has been completely worth it. And so I think that that's important. Also thinking about like scheduling tools. I personally use later to schedule content for Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook. I can even do LinkedIn and Instagram and Twitter, uh, TikTok, but I haven't gotten to all of those platforms just yet. But even knowing once I have a piece of content, I can kind of promote it on those different platforms, writing a list down of my system for how I go from creating a reel to then publishing a reel, things like that. I write it down for myself, but I also write it down in the sense that one day if I scale, and I hire someone else on to help me, it's all right there for them to see. And that way I don't have to worry about creating resources in the future. I've kind of been creating them all along. And I feel like just having that workflow and understanding what works well for you is so important. If you're not someone who can batch like six videos in a day, if you find that exhausting, that's okay. But then you wanna just figure out what works for you so you can still be consistent and not feel like you're burning out. And we've got lots of tutorials on how to make sure you are scheduling things appropriately, how you figure out how to figure out what you're doing inside of your business to work best for you, and how to make sure that you are doing this from a tech perspective as well. And because we know these tools and resources are incredibly important to keeping ourselves organized and making sure we are attaining those goals, I want to make sure that we are sending people over to you as a resource as well. So where can people connect with you to learn more about how to create those goals effectively? Yeah, so I have definitely done some blog posts and YouTube videos about this. I do also have my Patreon community, which is a monthly subscription service where I do include goal setting worksheets. And I also do monthly challenges and check-ins. I think that a lot of us do this ourselves, And to have that accountability of me just saying, it's the 15th of the month, how's your goals going? Which again, is something I can schedule. I don't even need to show up and actually do each month, but you still get the reminder each month. I think that's hugely important. Um, I created that community to you know, help influencers just kind of stay on top of things be able to get resources from me and see a behind the scenes look at my business. Um, so that is always an option as well. And of course, I create tons of free resources on my social media platforms. You can follow me and find me everywhere at Austin to Zone. 
Be sure to hit that subscribe and notification bell because we're dropping daily videos to help you level up your online business and make sure you're creating more profit through your social media while spending less time creating that content and having to deal with less stress as you're creating it. We're making sure that we're leveling up your influencer platform so that you are creating a life that you love without the stress and worry of how you're going to make that income. If you've got questions on how to deal with your influencer blog or website or any of your social media content, drop those down below and follow along because we're dropping daily videos on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, live streaming, the tools and resources you need to save yourself time and effort creating your social content and helping you to expand your influencer and online platforms to make the most out of what you're doing online. We'll answer your questions as we see them come in and we will see you in the next episode.